So this is our afternoon panel, and the, um, the idea of the afternoon panel is to spend some time really thinking about the nitty gritty of getting all of this done. And uh, from the big idea to the execution, uh, the challenges that, uh, that come with that. And uh, our fearless moderator, our fearless moderator is, no, <laughs> our fearless moderator is Robert Frazat who uh, is a widely read and very popular TV radio personality, writer, uh, really a kind of tremendous amount of interest. And we talked before what would be the appropriate term to describe it, and we, we settled on enfant terrible, I think. So we're, we're, we're good on that. And he, uh, he started as an investment banker at Goldman, and uh, two, two, two degrees. Uh, master in uh, public policy from the Woodrow Wilson School and an MBA from Harvard. So, uh, widely read. I think you fit the Jim Rogers description about that. Okay. Except for the Navy or like the Marines. <laughs> I'm not a Navy SEAL. Okay, not that Navy SEAL. Not for sure. Okay, good. All right. So, uh, thank you for, for joining us and thank you for moderating the panel. Take thank you. Away. I appreciate it. Corey, Bruce, Ben, Michael, if you could please start introducing yourselves and um, I'll, I'll soliloquize after you. Corey Brinkema, I'm president of the U.S. Office of the Forest Stewardship Council, uh, based out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. I'm probably one of the few people who actually got an uh, increase in temperature by coming here to <laughs> Chicago. Um, I've been with uh, FSC in this role for a little over six years, and uh, had come most recently from the uh, green building world as a, as a developer, kind of pushing uh, uh, the envelope, or at least trying to, uh, on standards for, for the built environment. Um, I got into kind of this realm uh, after spending 10 or so years cleaning up uh, hazardous waste and, and wanting to get maybe on the front end of this uh, sustainability movement rather than on the back end. So I uh, went back to business school, not at Kellogg. I got waitlisted here. Uh, I went to the other, other strong Midwest school, uh, University of Michigan. And um, so that's where I kind of uh, uh, really got, got immersed into sustainability and have been doing it ever since. So. Thanks, Corey. Uh, I'm Bruce Laurie. I'm from uh, uh, Toronto, which is about exactly the same temperature as here. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I run something called the Ivy uh, Foundation, which is a private family foundation in Canada that primarily funds uh, environmental policy work in Canada. Um, outside of that, uh, I just uh, completed my second book called Toxie and Tox Out, which comes out in uh, May in the United States. Um, looking at uh, toxic chemicals and what to do about them. And, uh, and I'm, I'm very involved as well. I'm going to talk about forests, but I do a lot of work on energy policy issues. And uh, uh, I'm on the board of something called the Ontario Power Authority, which oversees all of the electricity and energy planning in Ontario. So I was quite interested to hear the uh, lunchtime remarks. So, uh, Good afternoon. My name is Ben Packard, and I serve as the Director of Corporate Engagements with the Nature Conservancy. I've been on the job for all of seven weeks, so please take uh, everything I'm saying with a grain of salt. For the previous 15 years, I worked for Starbucks Coffee Company, and for the last six, I served as Vice President of Global Responsibility. And at Starbucks, that meant looking after the environmental strategy, the human rights strategy, the annual reporting, and the transparency that the company drove into its reporting around social responsibility. Really excited to be here today in this conversation. In my past life and in my future life, I will be dealing right in this intersection of <clears throat> NGO and private sector, among other actors, uh, relationships. So thank you. Uh, so I'm Michael Vandenberg. I uh, am a professor of law at Vanderbilt Law School. I um, was the EPA chief of staff early in the Clinton administration and then served in private practice as a partner at Latham & Watkins, which is a big national law firm. Uh, I left that to teach, and uh, my experiences there taught me that the law actually can't coerce as much behavior as I thought it could, uh, based on my law school experience. And so um, I work on how the law can change both corporate and household behavior through changing social norms. I work with sociologists, social psychologists, um, economists on a variety of different ways in which the law can drive behavior by driving information. It comes to, I think it, in the Starbucks case, it comes down to one word. It's about relevance. And it's about the perception, whether you call it Howard Schultz's vision or the enterprise-wide uh, perception of how to maintain the relevance with the consumer base, with the consumers, not only on a daily basis, but also with the employees who at Starbucks they call partners. So you guys got to help me keep my days and we's right, because I'm only on week seven with my new organization. <laughs> but at Starbucks, the, the, the values that unite the company are really not just a translation of, you know, we still have the 
they still have the, the founder in, in place as the chairman. Um, but it's about the relevance that they believe makes people want to come and stay at a company. You're talking about a quick service restaurant type of job with 250,000 people who have to translate that experience to the customer. They are the ones where the, who deal with the customers every single day. So if you can motivate your people with a set of values that bring together the company in a very compelling way that makes those people proud in all the different communities that they serve, that's a really powerful buy. Um, you're absolutely right. In fact, the shareholders that were trying to um, push the company to, whether it was on gun control or um, uh, equal, uh, the um, Initiative 71 in Washington State on uh, marriage, marriage equality, uh, there was no shareholder activism to do those things. And the shareholders that stood up and actually said, um, don't you think you're alienating a certain percent of your basis? And uh, I think our chairman was pretty clear and said, you could take, you could take your 37% returns and leave if you, if year over year over the last year if that's not good enough for you. But this is a, about being relevant in the eyes of our consumers and our people. No, I, I, I would say your, your relevance in the eyes of attracting new people, and the relevance in the eyes of uh, companies that are gonna wanna do business with you, the relevance of to communities where you might want to cite new stores, all of that's open. Like we've been talking about all day now, in the court of public opinion, that will determine your your business's ability to grow. So it's not just. I mean, you could talk about it. It is offer. It is marketing, um, but it's about really building this business in a self interested way. Our, our staff have been very closely communicating with uh, with Starbucks uh, over the years, and and. There are real challenges. I mean, just to be very clear so that folks understand kind of FSC's role in this, in this arena, we are, not, we are not your environmental NGO or by any means an activist NGO. We are kind of that place where, where business and uh, uh, civil society can, can come together and, and agree on a set of principles and ultimately a set of standards that companies would be willing to, uh, to abide by and agree to. So when we... <coughs> Um, when we approach a, a company like Starbucks or, you know, or, or a Kimberly Clark or uh, you know, maybe a, a Plum Creek or a Weyerhaeuser, um, you know, our, our objective is to say, hey, um, you know, we think that uh, um, you, know, you, you may be doing okay by largely operating in a North American context, especially if you're supplying in a North American context, but you could do better. Uh, that uh, you know, there's an opportunity. Starbucks is leading in so many areas. There's an opportunity to maybe lead in an area where they, they haven't necessarily been. And uh, uh, we think, uh, especially with the, I, mean, I think what we're talking about a lot, a lot here is is what's the the length of the the uh, term of thinking here? Is it you know short term, medium term, longer term? And Starbucks has shown that they're quite long term thinking. And we'd like to maybe bring that long term thinking to some other aspects of their uh, supply chain and particularly on, on paper. Um, and uh, so, you know, we know very clearly with, with a company like Starbucks and, and many of our other corporate partners that, you know, the, the difference between kind of what they're doing now and, and, and being FSC certified and, and bringing uh, an FSC certified product to market is, is there's a, a premium associated with that. Starbucks knows it, you know, down to the fractions of a penny what it costs to, to take a cup from its current position to, to a certified cup, and, and it's, it's significant. And uh, so we're, uh, we're working through that with them. We're working uh, um, to potentially bring some of that um, supply to market uh, to, to, uh, to, to a Starbucks and maybe begin to, uh, to turn that around before you know, ultimately having the whole, um, uh, you know, the whole enterprise uh, committed to to that kind of responsible sourcing. To be an ethical certification organization, especially one like ours that has, is, you know, we're founded and grounded in this balance of, of interest, social, environmental, economic, each have 33 and a third percent of the power within our system. So we have to be just as responsive to, you know, Starbucks or a, a Kimberly Clark as we do, you know, to a Greenpeace or World Wildlife Fund who are all members of FSC. Now, you know, Greenpeace or, or World Wildlife Fund may choose, you know, as part of their mission to, to be that stick, and that will happen. And it's, it's an awkward place for us to be in because I, you know, I, I, I am working with both of those organizations, um, but uh, we, have, we have to be extremely careful about information that we, uh, we gather through our work. And, um, and you know, I, I think that um, 
we, we can sometimes see these things coming. Uh, and, uh, and certainly we've had experience. I mean, a great example is Kimberly Clark. Um, you know, I don't know if anyone in, in the room here is from, from KC or not, but uh, you know, this is an organization that, gosh, for almost six, seven years was, was targeted by National Resources Defense Council and Greenpeace. It was a clear cut campaign playing off the Kleenex name and uh, you know and they held them off for years and years and years and then finally it started to get painful it started to impact their uh, their sales especially on the professional side and uh, uh, you know finally took two people a, a Greenpeace campaigner and, a, and an executive from Kimberly Clark to kind of bury the hatchet and you know gosh here we are three years later and and this uh, this company now is really a global leader in responsible sourcing and, and has decided you know rather than just to Kind of dabble in in responsible sourcing. They have they're literally close to 100 percent. Every single Kimberly Clark product, product, consumer based product in the U.S. now is FSC certified. Yeah. You know the idea that um, you know maybe you know do NGOs have credibility or not? Are corporations leading or not? What is the role of government? You know, is it going to work or not? And uh, and I really do think the reality is that there are some great NGOs, there are some great corporations, and there are some great governments doing really good things. And uh, no single one of those is ever going to be leading the pack. And so how do you figure out where is the leadership coming from? It's, it's, it's hard to figure out where leadership really comes from, I think. You know, ultimately, it's from individuals. In the case of, um, just to spend a minute, the, the program that um, you know, I think Daniel was first interested in uh, that we've been working on is, uh, is a very large collaborative. So rather than looking at one corporation, it's uh, the entire forest sector in Canada, 29 large forest companies, nine NGOs, uh, seven provinces, 178 million acres of land, uh, 600 First Nations <coughs> communities. So it's a, it's a massive undertaking to try to shift an entire resource sector, which is a large part of the Canadian economy, to one that's sustainable. And, um, and it, it's really interesting to me just to watch you know, who are in, in, this, in this dynamic of now in year three of trying to implement this agreement on the ground um, you know, where is the leadership coming from and where are the challenges? And, you know, in some cases, the NGOs at the table are, are uh, behaving as poorly as some of the corporations. Some of the leadership's coming from, ironically, given the lunchtime remarks, from the industry association. The fellow that leads the industry association is, is a dynamic leader that, that, that dragged many of his members kicking and screaming down the path of sustainability, convincing them that they wouldn't have a future uh, in global in global forestry, without demonstrating sustainability, so um, so I, you know I think it's um, uh, you know we really do need that balance. Um, you know I'm sorry the green Greenpeace is here, but with respect to a Greenpeace Canada, uh, I don't think we would have had this kind of an agreement if it wasn't for the activism of Greenpeace Canada pushing the companies, you know, driving the companies crazy, forcing them to the table. At the same time, when it came to the negotiations. Um, Greenpeace, frankly, was not, not very effective negotiating at the table. They ended up pulling out of the agreement, and, um, and I think the agreement's better off, you know, uh, by having... Uh, oops, I wasn't supposed to say that out loud. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, by having organizations that actually are, are believe that their role in life is negotiating, not, you know, throwing stones. So, um, so I guess, my, my, you know, our comments were in, in the hallway, really, that... Um, there is no real one group that has all the answers, and uh, and we need to figure out how to pull together those interesting collaborations and and make sure that wherever the leadership is coming from, whether it's from corporations or NGOs, frankly, very rarely is it ever from government, um, you know, that you're able to create the kind of system where the leadership bubbles up to the top. And and in fact, in all of the work we're doing, I would say. Uh, and in the in the realm of the, uh, the the private politics notion, the the greatest resistance to this work is from governments, mm -hmm. and uh, they really mm -hmm. don't like the fact that we've pulled together all of the players to make the decisions that governments traditionally were making in terms of mm -hmm. land use planning and forest resource allocation um, in Canada. So it's I, I, to me that's an interesting experience, and we're now trying to figure out how to engage governments early on. And I was just talking to. Uh, the premier's office in Manitoba the other day, just about where we're at with a you know a very large development there, because um, we we ultimately and again just to reflect on this morning's panel, it, it is ultimately about moving these things into a legislative framework. So uh, this isn't just about 
a, a, a voluntary agreement. It's ultimately um, regulatory in terms of forest practices and uh, and protected areas on the ground. And this is the guy that's just moved from the private sector to the NGO sector, who's very interesting in very interestingly receiving lots of very monolithic comments as I've made this move myself. Boy, you're joining the dark side. Oh, that means you're going to act like this. Oh, that means this. And there's tons of labeling that goes on between sectors. There are more than carrots and sticks. There are books, there's science, there's information, there's analytics, there's new sources of value, there's doorways that partnerships open. So I'd love for us to have a conversation if we're going to talk about you know, filling the gap as in not such sing simple terms as which, what each sector can bring to the table. And then, as this example that Bruce just talked about, within each sector there are different players that need to be involved at different stages of the life cycle. Greenpeace may have been great at surfacing the issue but they were not gonna be good at driving a deal. So understanding the theater and understanding the life cycle of, of a, when an issue gets raised and who are the best players would be a much more nuanced, I think, and useful way for us to think about how the gap gets filled because the player that enters may not be there at the table at the end. Mm -hmm. One other indignant comment. Um, leadership comes from a system. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Rudin. No, you're good. Leadership comes when we're solving problems at the system level and not just from a uh, single corporation saying, I need to solve this problem, but when you, can, when you can think like a system and act like a system and bring the different actors that can come in to solve that problem. Because um, I think that's what Jason was getting at this morning, I don't know if he's still here, but from WWF, about the need to accelerate our solutions. One-to-one -one relationships are not going to get us there. Sorry. So, so maybe there's a good jumping off point, because I think that uh, we've talked about a lot of the ways in which private governance substitutes for public governance. Um, and you mentioned it as a system. And, and one of the real differences between government and private governance is it's not a system. It's a bottom-up, atomistic collection of different interests over time. And one function that government plays is it sets priorities. And in theory, we have a president in part because we think one individual can do a little bit of prioritization. But there is no one president of private governance. Um, so, uh, so to start with, to what extent is private governance really filling a gap well, there were almost two dozen major pollution control statutes between 1970 and 1990. How many have we had since then? None, zero, right? So if you're waiting for the next big event, we used to, and when we taught environmental law, we used to teach disaster begets statute. So you get Bhopal, and then you get the, the amendments to the CERCLA, et cetera. We just had the, the BP event in the Gulf. What statute was emerged? None, right? So if you're waiting for a disaster to provoke a statute, maybe we're in a different era. Or so coal ash. Coal ash, you're not seeing action on that. Uh, the West Virginia spill that occurred recently, I'm not seeing a lot of movement. Maybe we'll see some. So in any event, we now teach environmental law so that uh, I now teach environmental law. So I teach the public statute and then the private response. There's NEPA, and then there are the equator principles, right? Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the Superfund statute, there is now... Um, about $400 million a year is spent on the EPA enforcement budget every year. Um, how much money is spent on private investigations associated with M&A transactions and real estate transactions? $500 million a year. So more money is being spent by private enforcement, private investigation, than the entire EPA enforcement budget. So you're seeing an enormous amount of private movement. What you're not seeing, from my perspective, and we talk a lot about accountability and so forth, is I don't see where the, where the um, the ability emerges in this system to think about how we prioritize it. If it were me, I would step back and say, what's the one issue that might potentially change all the others we work on? For me, that's climate change. And uh, we have hundreds of different groups working on different issues. So from my perspective, what's interesting is whether or not somehow this movement can find a way, this movement, this group of different organizations can find a way to, to, uh, if, to effectively prioritize those issues that truly matter in the long run. <clears throat> and make a difference. And I think they have to because of my experience with what's going on with government. I don't see government filling that gap, at least as to climate change. Well, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me, particularly with uh, you know, the, 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 the campaigns against Keystone XL, which is you know, to bring oil from Canada largely um, from the tar sands. And then the tar sands campaigns you know, are largely funded by American foundations. And, uh, and one of the reasons, it would be sort of an interesting case study of an, an almost a, an early stage uh, activist campaign that has, you know, many years before, say, where we were at in forests. But, you know, I, I question whether the style of campaigning is really going to get people where they think they're going to get to uh, in the long term. Um, I'm not sure there's enough conversations happening about alternatives. I'm not sure there's enough 
um, engagement of people on the ground in communities. It is, it's a very old style, top down um, activist campaign. And then the irony, I think, too, is so we're looking at all of this attention on the tar sands. Well, the fracking seems to be going on, you know, at an unprecedented scale without any regulation whatsoever. And, um, and so it's, you know, I think, I think, frankly, it's what leads to a, a lack of credibility of the environmental movement when they get so focused on one thing and yet all this other stuff's happening in their backyard mm -hmm. and they seem either unaware or, or, um, or not really as focused on that. So it, it, just, it, it just adds to the complexity of, sure. of the issues. It's, but fra I mean, fracking is huge. But then you've got jurisdictions like New York and Quebec that have a moratorium on fracking, right? You've got some places that have no regulations on fracking and others like British Columbia that's got a, a really great regulatory framework for fracking. So, you know, it, it's, uh, it's a good case study to look at. Someone I, I do think that, that for example, if, if the private governance movement were really, uh, were really focused on what mattered, it would be climate. And we would have on those cell phones, you would be determining what the carbon content of, of, of comp the company you're about to walk into the door with and, uh, and also the product that you're dealing with. And that would then drive supply chain contracting differences, and that would then change the incentives of the countries that are now not interested in participating in post-Kyoto negotiations. So I think you know, if, if we put our money where our mouth is, that's where it ought to go. And I think 100 years from now, people will look back, and they won't remember most of what most of us did. But they will say, what did you do when you knew enough to know that there would be several hundred generations worth of harm? And cell phones are a great vehicle through which you can convey information that you can then change your own behavior and begin to put pressure on, on companies to uh, change the supply chain uh, carbon yes. content. One, one, the smartphone is not just a one-way thing between the developing country and the, and the, and the consumer. The, the, the two-way conversation that could emerge as more uh, producers in developing countries actually could be connected with the consumer could potentially challenge the role of NGOs that are right now playing an arbiter role. And I think that's an that's a angle that we, we always could think about. Crowd out the NGO? Well, right now the NGO is the arbiter. I know what's going on on the ground, or my standard is the standard that's going to validate to the consumer that your brand is. Well, I thought the journalist was the arbiter. <laughs> well, sometimes, um, but the the opportunity for the consumer to actually connect with the producer, um, because right now basically NGOs are validators in a lot of respects, um, whether it's a certification system of something that the company wants to convey to their consumer they're doing, and. The, the, you know, if you want to talk about smartphones and social media, I think the, the two-way conversation that has potential um, is, is a lot richer than, than we realize. Yeah, well, I was just going to say, one of the things that we're, we're just starting to see um, is, uh, yeah, so in the, in the realm of certification is that, you know, at, at present, you know, our, our system is built on, largely in terms of enforcement, is built on an annual process that occurs. Maybe it's over the course of a month or so or two months. Uh, you know, where an audit team goes in and, you know, reviews the practices over the past, you know, year, go, goes and does uh, uh, field visits and, and interviews uh, both employees as well as, as local stakeholders. But, but yeah, with, uh, with increasing use of, of social media and, and, uh, and cell phone cams and other, um, uh, other communication mechanisms, uh, those in the community that live in and around the forest have an opportunity to be that auditor through the rest of the year. So we're just starting to see, I mean, we had an issue that- I mean, it's crowdsourcing it, enforcement. It, it, yeah, it is, it is, it is. And it, it, it's a little- I know it sounds very whimsical, Tom Freeman, yeah. you know, the world is flat, yeah. but it's really happening. It, it is. Companies it's are being called a, out. A little on. challenging in our world in that oftentimes those lands are, are private lands and you're not really supposed to access <laughs> them, but, but people people do. You know, a little different in places like Canada and you know, where there's a lot of private or public land that's, that's certified. But we had an issue that came up uh, a number of months ago in, in Australia where, uh, it turned out that some uh, koala, koalas were migrating from a national park onto some uh, uh, plantation, eucalyptus plantation lands, uh, actually going after a, a, stri a species of eucalyptus that they actually shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be eating because they're not, not particularly nutritious, but they were migrating and the company was not taking proper precautions to, to, to manage it. And, and, uh, and there were local local residents who were seeing this happen, koalas dying on FSC certified lands. and. Made it uh, made it quite clear to the um, to the community to to the certifiers that this was happening and and that company was was essentially their certificate was suspended within a few weeks. 
The, the, the um, universities are actually very sensitive to what their students want. They're very sensitive to what applicants want. Um, and so I think actually that students, and particularly applicants to universities at, and professional schools as well, um, have much more power than they think they do. And I think that the many private governance institutions haven't harnessed that as well as you might think. Uh, and that universities are not as transparent as you might otherwise expect they would be. In many cases, corporations, uh, we know a great deal more about what they do, what their carbon footprint is, et cetera. And so I think there is an opportunity there to see real change, not just in universities, but other uh, non-corporate but non-governmental institutions as well. Although we have an enormous amount of social media out there and immediate access to information, students aren't reading the newspaper anymore. They, they don't read, and, and yeah. the electronic media is not substituting for the newspaper. I, I'm sorry if that's a, a hit on journalism, but uh, they do not know what's going on in the world. And they might hear it through a Twitter feed or something like that, but they don't have more than a sentence or two a level of information. And so I think a really important role the universities can play is to induce them to get re-engaged on a more in-depth level with the world. I think you might then see more engagement for better or worse. The opportunity for Amazon is actually not crowdsourcing information about the products themselves as it relates to sustainability claims or attributes of their products, but Amazon is fiercely focused on the consumer. And if you look at the trends that tell us younger consumers today want to do business with companies, Amazon has the opportunity, or I should finish that sentence, do companies that reflect their values, do business with companies that reflect their values. Amazon has a tremendous opportunity to put the information in front of consumers that they've already attracted a much younger demographic um, similar to the way they've changed the way packaging and distribution and logistics. Um, so I, I think there's a huge opportunity. So Amazon's another interesting area where we see a gap in what the government requires and where private governance could work. So right now, uh, EPA requires, due to some legislation passed several years ago, that, uh, that we disclose carbon emissions if we have more than 25,000 metric tons at a single facility or if we import into the country fuels that, uh, that it would cause more than 25,000 metric tons of emissions. Um, so what happens if you're overnight shipping? Right? Uh, are your facilities big enough to be regulated? Well, probably not, right? Just a warehouse, it's not a factory. Uh, what about your planes? Well, that's actually accounted for by the person supplying the fuel. Right? So what, hap what would happen if every time you decided whether you wanted overnight shipping or two-day shipping or one-week shipping, you also got to choose what your carbon footprint was of your shipping? Right? What a remarkable effect that could have on consumer awareness and potentially on the carbon footprint of the economy. Is that going on right now? You know, I don't see it. Absolutely. We actually looked at, uh, there are more than 10 carbon footprint calculators available on the internet. And we actually ran the same individual statistics through, through all 10. And we found a remarkably wide disparity. Uh, so, you know, so you have to, so having the tool is one thing, having an accurate tool is yeah. another. But, but those tools are out there. Uh, I say, but, uh, you know, I think, too, in, in, a, in a lot of these conversations, and again, as was alluded to earlier, there's, there's a lot of emphasis being put on the role of consumers. And at the end of the day, I think consumers can help play a role. I think they can help uh, inform companies that there's demand. I think companies can demonstrate that they can respond to that demand by changing some of their product offerings. But until we start thinking of people as citizens and people mm -hmm. electing governments who actually believe that climate change is real and exists and understands that we need a future that looks very different than the pathway we're on, I don't really believe that consumer behavior and private politics is going to take us very far. So um, it's all, in my view, it's all the, the end game is changing the economic rules so that the incentives are built into the system. And that's a... Um, our, the, the ambitious goal of the new Ivy Foundation program, uh, at least in Canada. So, um, you know, we need to be we need to be pricing these things. And there's a lot of economists in the room. I'm assuming, like, how do we, you know, how do we get to the point where you're engaging individuals through some of these tools to think about what are the prices? How do we price the the externalities of pollution and social cost into these products? Not just, um, you know, sort of more like almost. You know, a lot of these apps are almost more like games, you know, as opposed to you know, the real tools that we need. Yeah, so, <laughs> so one challenge is that uh, how likely is it that we'll have a national and international carbon price in the next five to ten years? I don't know anyone who thinks it's going to happen. And so 
So the question then is, what can you do between now and whenever that time comes? Because I think, I, I agree, I don't think anyone would argue that a carbon price isn't the optimal remedy. The question is, if it takes a, a decade to get it, do you do something between now and then? Let me give you an example of what private governance could do. Um, uh, right now, uh, as we get more and more certain about the climate science, the American population gets less and less certain, right? So uh, a third of all Democrats and two thirds of all Republicans don't think anthropogenic climate change is happening, even though 95 to 100 percent is the likelihood indicated by the scientists and the IPCC. And, it's, and, the U and the U.S. numbers are going down as the science gets more certain. So why don't we have a climate prediction market where you and I could trade the likelihood that the IPCC's projection for 2020 or 2030 is correct or not? And in conversations, we could put our money where our mouth is. Or politicians could do the same thing. And you get up in the morning and you look on your, your I would read the news, newspaper, I'd read the Wall Street Journal, but the, my students would read their handheld device and see what the price of the prediction of global sea level increase in 2030 is. And that price would signal the likelihood. So if you're a skeptic, an independent, a moderate, and you think markets are better than government anyway, there's one signal. So to me, if, again, if we were really taking this issue seriously, we would be looking for these opportunities. The second one, very quickly, is uh, you know, we all know that our grandchildren won't have any clue what we did once we knew that climate uh, was a problem, except for those who are in the media a lot, right? Um, but that's, that's a solvable information problem, too. What if we had a registry where, um, where you could actually indicate, uh, you know, this is what I did. This is what I did differently. Politicians could do it. Corporations could do it. Hold your feet to the fire, right? When Starbucks knew what the climate science said, this is what Starbucks total carbon emissions were year over year, knowing that your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, et cetera, down the line would know. All that could not really be done by government. There's not a chance that government would do that. Private institutions might begin to move the dial. I have a paper called The China Problem, where I suggest supply chain contracting in a way to, as a way to create incentives for China to reduce carbon emissions. So I think it is central, and I think uh, we, that's one of the few ways we can get around sovereignty concerns, is to use those supply chain, use the 10,000 Walmart suppliers in China, use consumer demand. Roughly, maybe between 10 and 20% of China's carbon emissions are associated with supplying us and the EU with goods, right? So we have the opportunity to continue buying those goods as we do, or to insist on lower carbon. So I think that's one of the very few ways we can actually reach China. Yeah, I mean, when we're doing it right now, and it's, 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 it's not visible and, and it's happening very you slowly over. We don't guy. have well, well, I guess we maybe we do have a stick, it, and and and, it's, and the stick is you know Home Depot and IKEA and and, uh, and Walmart <laughs> and others who are saying, hey, you know we number one we got to get the worst of the worst out of our supply chain, and there's a lot of that in China, um, and it's been making its way to the U.S. and, and some of it's you know violating our, our new laws, our, our our amendments to the Lacey Act, and, and in many cases it's it's the kind of stuff and products that these companies would be embarrassed about. So they're saying. You know, at a minimum, we got to get the worst of the worst, and ideally, over time, we're going to move to higher levels of sustainability, represented by certified wood products or paper products. So they're doing it, and it's happening, and, and it's maybe too slow, but uh, but it is happening. Thank you. This is this has been so wonderful, and I've taken much of what you've discussed regarding koala bears and land use and climate change, and tried to um, distill it down to advocacy work that I do, which is around civil rights and social justice here in the United States. And I have a Herculean task for you to think about here. I'd like to get your thoughts to anyone. What would your um, approach be to address the education issue in this country or the failure of the public education um, system in this country from a corporate standpoint? How would you push state and federal governments to better educate our children from K through 12, perhaps arguing that without assisting um, the federal and state governments, you will not have the talented workforce you need to do the job you must do. What role do you see? And I know all the corporations do things in the community and they have um, private employees volunteer in the community, but on a wide scale basis, how would you go about pushing state and federal governments to give you the kind of workforce that you need? I'll, I'll take a shot at that. I'm uh, not an education expert either. Um, <laughs> but, um, but I do think if, if you're trying to engage, if you're trying to engage a company in, in finding that <clears throat> nexus of enlightened self-interest, I think framing it in the context of the locations where they their workforce is coming from now and where they see it coming from in the future. So while you probably want broad engagement from XYZ Corporation at a national level, you might get better traction 
within the corporation and mobilize all the assets they have, which is not just the numbers of people they might be employing in that community now and into the future, but also the assets they have in terms of the relationships that they might have with policymakers or other influentials in that community to get that piece of agenda and that, that, that piece of legislation and that agenda moving forward. Um, I'm curious, my question is really about uh, the tactic of reporting today. Huge amount of foundation money and uh, time of people inside corporations is being spent on reporting. And the whole new SASB, you know, maybe that's promising. A CEO said to me recently that he didn't think his successor would even bother to publish a sustainability report and was clearly very disturbed about that. And I thought, good, in a way. I don't, is it a tactic? What, what's going on? What's the next generation? And is the kind of area of requiring corporations to report to a standard, even if we get into the kind of question of materiality and whatever says we may do that's an improvement over GRI at this point. Like, what's your feeling about this at this point? Well, I'll uh, take a shot. Uh, starting at that, I, I just convened a group uh, in Toronto the other day with corporate social responsibility, uh, responsibility people and some accounting people and uh, business school people. And, and one of the issues that came up was reporting. And I, and I think there's a, there's a sense that, again, uh, sustainability reporting, if it's just simply companies telling people what they're doing, is of very little value. And I think even the, the leading businesses uh, the, um, uh, are starting to realize that this is, is not really sufficient. So the question is, are they starting to uh, report on things that are more meaningful to the bottom line as opposed to just reporting generally you know, happy sustainability news? And I think companies are starting to uh, question the value of sustainability. Even the leading, like the the, the leading edge companies, are probably going to be dropping their sustainability reports, and the laggard companies are going to start creating sustainability reports. That's my sense of where things are going. And I think the leading companies realize they need to be doing a whole lot more than just reporting on you know how much water they saved. And I would just add, I think the companies are getting a better definition of their audience. When they started, a lot of companies started reporting. They were reporting for this audience right in this room, mm -hmm. the academics, the NGOs, the financial uh, media, um, because they thought that that was the, the most important audience. At Starbucks, when I became vice president of Global Responsibility, we were producing a 70-page paper report that no one read. Our own people, who was the intended audience, were not reading that report. Mm -hmm. We brought it down to a 12-page document that had uh, 13 very specific goals that was communicated in a much more accessible way. It's still too big, probably, in my mind. Um, so I think you're going to see new mediums at a lot of companies. The SASB may be the backbone of some of, of the information that is communicated. But if SASB requires a certain format of reporting, it'll be dead on the arrival, just like GRI. Um, but if they can articulate the clear material issues that need to be reported and let creative companies communicate the way that's most appropriate for the audiences they're trying to reach, it could be a much more dynamic conversation. Sir. Uh, just piggybacking on that then, uh, about metrics, a uh, very good point raised. So what about, uh, for instance, a uh, carbon footprint calculator was mentioned, but obviously different companies are good at different things. So Amazon may be great at, say, serving energy and supply chain or Walmart, but both uh, companies have uh, issues with labor practices unionization or lack thereof. So how is the consumer, uh, what are some tools that consumers can use to balance or at the end of the day, is it a, is it a consumer, you, you sort of like pay your money and make your choice or is there a better way beyond that? I don't know of a method for doing that. I mean, I, I can tell you that I prioritize car, uh, climate. Uh, there's, I think again, 100 years from now, I think that's the thing everyone will ask what we did. And so I, for myself, I think that's what, what ought to be given priority, but I don't, I know that I, a lot of people don't share that. So. I don't know of a mechanism you can use that easily does it. I think a lot of different labeling and disclosure systems have different yeah. weights that they give to these. Yeah, well, we have. Yeah, it, that's a really good point. And having um, uh, ha having metrics to measure a company that's let's say not providing a certified product, you know, whether it's fair trade or or FSC, which has a fairly strong social component, both for labor communities and and also for indigenous peoples. But um, I mean, that's one thing that we would certainly. Um, uh, hope that, uh, that that FSC provides some some guarantee of, of that. Now, 
to date, we've really been focused on what's happening at the forest floor. So labor and community and indigenous rights at the forest floor. There's a very strong movement right now within the FSC. It's, it's quite controversial, but it's bringing um, some of those um, labor protections in, in particular uh, into our chain of custody. So that's where you know, an international paper now you know, will have to obey all the relevant ILO conventions, uh, not all of which the US have ratified. And there's a lot of you know, companies and, and NGOs who are super supportive of that in Europe. Not so much in the United States. So that's something that we're, we're kind of struggling with right now. Um, but, uh, but it is something, ultimately, if, you know, if those things really are brought into the system, that, um, that, that those sort of protections, will have, you, you will have some guarantee that those have been uh, respected throughout the value chain. Ben mentioned uh, that leadership comes uh, when we are addressing, I mean, a new type of leadership emerged when we are addressing it issues at a system level. And during the day we have been talking about collaboration or adversarial relationship between NGOs and uh, corporations. And it's, it's clear through, it, at least from, from my corner of the world, that very few question that more collaboration is needed. The question is what type of collaboration? And this issue of a system vision to address complex uh, social problems, and at the same time to materialize significant business opportunities, uh, it's uh, emerging in a way that uh, can be quite uh, powerful and compelling. Uh, Starbucks have uh, done it, uh, or, or let's say is doing it, because as any model, it needs to continue refining it from the perspective of linking small farmers to your value chain. Uh, you mentioned the, the issue of uh, forestry in Canada as an example. And the question that I, that I have uh, is how, what does that say to us in terms of the new tools, the new how-tos, the new even uh, skills that leaders need to develop to operate not from the perspective of the self-interest of one entity, be that a, a civil society organization or a corporation, but truly advancing a, uh, the, a, a vision that it's a systemic vision with multiple stakeholders. Mm -hmm. What are we missing in terms of a, a toolkit that will a, um, a make a significant difference? Well, I think there are some sort of tools that are out there. And I'm, I was on a panel a while ago talking about systems change. And, and the, the one panelist I was with was sort of a systems change consultant that had you know, massive flow charts and complex diagrams and things. And, and I said, well, we just kind of all sat in a room for a lot of time and figured it out. <laughs> and so, and we both came to the same conclusion at the end. And our models looked almost identical. Um, so I, you know, in the case of the forest example in Canada, it was, uh, you know, almost two years of extensive meetings and building trust. And, uh, and still, and at, at the end of the day, still the trust, you know, I described, so there's, there was outlier, the NGO outlier and the forest company outlier who sued each other. Um, so there wasn't a lot of trust at the, at the uh, you know, at the bookends. But in the center, there's a huge amount of trust was built to the point where the companies and the NGOs were talking the same language and going out and, you know, having lunch together and, and, under, and finding where their common bonds were. So, you know, I don't know how many, how much of that was tools or techniques or social innovation or just people getting together and spending time and starting to understand what their own values were and where they shared values. And I, I'm, I'm a, I think, a bigger believer in the latter. Mm -hmm. Do we have time for one more question? To ask Aurora you? had her hand up. One quick question or comment. We have to be more vulnerable and more open to mm -hmm. things beyond zero-sum games when we're solving problems at a systems level. Mm -hmm. A, an, an open mindedness about winning and losing from your sector's perspective is going to create a really narrow mm -hmm. junction solution at a Pacific junction, but it's not going to actually develop the kind of solutions that are going to be mm -hmm. system wide and enduring. Just I won't add, add to that again, just a, a specific experience. One, one of the things that we have used this Kimberly Clark uh, experience uh, as a poster child quite a bit, and it, it, I think that is really telling. They, you know, came from this for them a horrendous campaign by these activists, and 
And it, it is really, truly remarkable where they are at right now. And, and I think it, 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 the reason why they are where they're at is that um, they've gotten a few folks to, uh, within a corporation who've been willing to invite these activists uh, to the table, uh, you know, to their headquarters and sit down with the highest levels of, of the organization and, and to have that interpersonal contact and, and for each other to have share their, you know, really what their ultimate uh, needs are and, and both to understand the challenges that both of them face in the, in the work that they do and to understand, you know, we can't, we can't go, you know, to responsible sourcing overnight and, and what it's gonna take and, and really educating the activists and the activists, you know, sharing some of their science and, and some of their needs. And, and now, you know, they've, they've got a green piece at the table. They're, you know, very committed and, and involved with the World Wildlife Fund and NFSC is there as well. And so, you know, and it even gets to all this reporting. Those two organizations, WWF and Greenpeace, are basically telling them what they need to see in these, uh, in these impact reports, these sustainability reports. So it, that has really integrated throughout the, um, that kind of ethic and uh, throughout the, the or corporate organization. I wanted to come back to the question that you asked about students, what do students think? And I will refer back to David's comment this morning about advocacy being a luxury good for the developed market. And um, I think a lot of people in this room probably teach the one percenters or they are teaching kids who are on their way to being one percent by virtue of the fact that they get into places that are this amazing. I teach the rest. I teach the ones that aren't the one percent and they tend to think that these problems, these egregious corporate scandals are a bunch of white guys sitting in a room maniacally laughing and plotting the end of the world. And they don't, they remove themselves, quite frankly, from personal accountability. That they too play a role in the overall big picture of, of what we're trying to attain here. Um, so I'm wondering just in general when trying to engage in an audience that is larger by volume but less powerful in terms of its economic and, and other capital that it brings to the table, how do you get past any sort of victim mentality or despair or other things that um, keep people from realizing the power that collectively they could bring to the table? How have you engaged in some of the markets you're in with people who normally don't see themselves as, themselves as advocates for something? Just really quickly, I think one of the most remarkable things that's happened in the last decade is on some level, uh, you think about uh, Dunkin' Donuts is heavily engaged in, in some sustainable related issues. Walmart, um, you know, just uh, if you buy a filet of fish now, it has an MSC label on it. So one of the things that's interesting is that we really have gone from it being a, a, a Whole Foods phenomenon to something much broader in the last five to 10 years. I'm not sure you would have predicted that 10 or 15 years ago, but uh, exactly how that's happening, I couldn't tell you. Well, I think there's a huge value, certainly, uh, you know, and I, we're fighting more and more in our work, the need to engage people in the communities where the forest activities are happening. So there's a, and you know, it's still very much the case where it's a, an urban versus rural or urban versus northern dynamic. And uh, so, um, you know, we've, I think a lot of us have learned the extent to which, you know, being kind of the, the, the urban guy at the foundation, um, you know, the extent to which you really need to be engaging with uh, the local communities, with First Nations, yeah. and, um, and, and they have to be at the table and, and participating. And I think, I don't know, I'm finding in Canada there's more and more, someone's asking about students, I met with a young student yesterday who uh, just finished a PhD in biology, and she's created an organization called Evidence for Democracy, which is fighting government cutbacks to science. And like, that, it was one of the greatest meetings I've been in in a little while, you know, just seeing a really young student taking on the government around science cutbacks, and so um, you know, I think uh, you know, I, I'm I, I, I'm not I don't believe that students are going to solve all the world's problems. I mean, eventually they will when they're older, maybe. But um, you know, we need to. Uh, there are a lot of great students um, and young people uh, across the board that I, I find are are getting more engaged than they have historically on these issues. So I, I find it encouraging. Mm 